Cinequest Artists and Innovator Forum. I'm Halston, the director and co-founder of Cinequest. And at our forums through the years, we've always brought forward the latest and greatest technologies that have empowered both the artist as well as the audience. You would have seen at Cinequest first, great time back in the day, digital distribution to the internet. Nobody was doing it until we did. Uh, the first digital cameras, which everybody laughed at. I'll never, it'll never work. Yeah, 35 millimeter will never be replaced by that video, et cetera, et cetera. You would have seen the workflow of the first digital uh, movies on cell phones, mobile cinema. So this is a place to really learn about the future of film. And we're very fortunate today because we are going to learn about not only the future, but what's happening right today. A very exciting opportunity for you to utilize a new form of filmmaking to bring your visions to audiences in bigger and better ways. We're going to start by looking at some example clips of 4K cinema, and then I'll bring up our moderator and our special guest, and we'll be uh, talking to you about the great world of 4K and how you can use it for your film vision. I'd like to welcome you and thank you for being with us, which is very, very, very kind of you. And we're excited to bring you something in return. Uh, Barnaby Dallas is the head of production at Spartan Films. He's the producer of All About Dad and Superhero Party Clown, which were two big hits and sellout films here at the festival's past couple of years. He's a great writer. He also teaches story at DreamWorks Animation. And he's a great friend of CineQuest, Barnaby Dallas. Thank you. Um, I was fortunate enough to uh, moderate uh, the 4K panel before Taxi Driver, and um, I came into it with a load of questions. Um, again, I, I work at San Jose State University, I teach there, so I'm very interested in how technology, how advances in technology really can be applied to filmmaking. How can it be used? And so I surveyed a bunch of my students, uh, fellow colleagues, etc. And the questions that um, I, I was loaded with were um, completely um, not only answered, but I, I feel like I was educated Wednesday um, on why 4K is important and really what it is. I, I was, I thought I knew how it would be used from end to end, but I really, I really learned. Now today, Halton and I were fortunate enough to have lunch with our with our speaker here, and I was trying to prep for some questions, and boy, he can give you 4K 101. This man has passion, 
Uh, I saw him in an interview just before here. He just he just goes and he knows. He's really, really passionate. So I don't want to waste too much time with the introduction, except here is a man who has been at Sony from beta cam to 4K. He has seen the industry change, transform. He will be able to enlighten you on exactly not only what it is, how you can use it, and even opportunities. There's a, a studio in Culver City that filmmakers can just go into and experiment with. It's, it's really an exciting opportunity. So I would like to welcome uh, Rob Willox up at Marketing. So, uh, so. And uh, Rob has a presentation that he's going to give us, and I will ask questions uh, as he's going along, and then when we're done, we'll open it up to you guys. So, Rob. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you very much for taking some time on a, during a busy festival to, to join us. Um, we're going to have a Q&A period at the end, so uh, save up those skill testing questions. Our Sony Media Group interviewed me before the program today. And the toughest questions I've ever had on 4K were from our own group, which was kind of interesting, so they've exhausted me. I'm going to go through the shameless marketing first, and then we'll get to some, some good technology. But the, the very, very sh short story about 4K is when they set the bar for digital cinema, they wanted to set that bar high. The Digital Cinema Initiative wanted to have a, a structure where the future of your experience in the theater would be rich, vibrant, remembering, and hopefully better than you could get at home. A reason to go to the theater and have that experience. But along the way, everything that happens in the theater usually gets translated to an HBO or especially networks and then to broadcast. So you know, the first innovation in film was color, rapidly was adopted, and then rapidly adopted color TV for black and white actually took much longer than standard definition date to uh, high definition. Uh, widescreen was the, the next facet, and television fundamentally changed with the, with the digital adoption, and the whole fashion of television changed. Once we had a flat panel, and once we had 60 by 9 resolution, that was it. CRT died a, a very, very quick death. But we could finally start to see most of what the filmmaker had in mind when they envisioned that overall scene. And uh, something a lot more closer to a film experience. Surround sound also came with digital. And then over the past couple of years, the TV manufacturers have been trying to make a business out of 3D, which is very, very difficult to do. But 3D has been very successful at the box office, and that needs to translate into a home experience. And finally, now we have 4K movies, and 4K will make the transition to, to the home theater. So where did this come from? Again, the, the DCI spec was established to have interchange. Right now, it's previous to this, it was film, sprocket holes, film fits into different projectors, there's different release prints for, for different theaters, but they wanted to have a, quote, digital film, so no matter what the theater was, they could have the aspect ratio, the sound, the encryption methodology, and that needed a standard, and that's where 4K started from. They wanted to set a bar that would be technologically very high. So I, I want to put this in perspective, and that's the end of the shameless marketing. The rest of it is all is all easy, and things we can have some fun with. But this little box represents four by three television. So this is what we. Uh, those of you, I I just turned fifty. Uh, with Betacam, I was only twelve when I started. So um, four by three television. This is the representation of four by three, and this would be what high definition. When we look at 2K, it's just we square off the pixels so we've got a, a little bit more room to, to work with. So this is what 2K would look like. Then we put that against Quad Field HD. And what Quad Field HD is the television standard for 4K. So it's 4 times 1080p. So things that are shot at 1080p will scale very well to QHD television. It, it was funny to watch you in a previous interview work the math out a couple times. <laughs> that was really funny. Yeah, you know, as a, as a marketing guy, math is supposed to be my strong suit. And, mm -hmm. But um, you can see the difference in pixels that we go from, from roughly 400,000 pixels to 8.3 million in two generations of television and two generations of experiences here. And then finally, we square off these pixels and this creates the 4K, which uh, is 4096 by 2160, so a little bit more than four times the 
There is another television standard that's also coming that is um, NHK's UHD 8K, which would be four times UHD. So for those of you who are going to go to NEB, seek out and watch the NHK demonstration because it truly is a religious experience to sit down and watch this. So not only is the picture 8K, the audio is 22.2 channels. So it's really a fundamental thing. So I'm not trying to infer that 4K is a pit stop in terms of television. It is certainly a worthy goal, but there is a whole other plan for the next 30 years that is being started by NHK. That gives you an idea of the, of the resolution. So we all grew up on this little square, and, and some of us, myself included, that square was black and white and relatively low resolution. Uh, we all survived the VHS era where we would watch movies and 200 lines of resolutions with terrible color and thought it was a pretty wonderful experience. So now uh, we're on the verge of you streaming RGB 444 4K to the home and have that as an experience. So uh, not bad for 25 years. We get accused of this is a Sony thing and it, it really isn't. Uh, the DCI set the spec for cinema and at this CES there's 28 different manufacturers that showed something in in UHD or 4K, so we're joined by Samsung, LG, all of the usual suspects will have small, medium, and large screens available in 4K. The primary job right now is to upconvert 1080p, uh, make 720p a bigger experience, and get you to enjoy a wider color space. Uh, but we're certainly not alone in this endeavor, it is an industry-wide push. And it's not just about getting you 4K and resolution. There's scaling engines in the in the set, and the set are built to a standard to handle to handle UHD that your experience of watching 2K, 1080, 3D is is all enhanced because of the upscaling engine. So the, the funny thing was we went down the active path for 3D televisions where you had to wear glasses with shutters in them, and it wasn't the most popular thing in the world. This our new sets are now passive 3D and. Um, absolutely wonderful. But everybody thinks that 4K, and a lot of the marketing hype is 4K is just about resolution. So, okay, I can see things clear. That's great, and, and I'm probably gonna enjoy that, but really that's just where we begin with 4K, and it's certainly not the destination. From a, from a company standpoint, this is, this is our wheelhouse. We make equipment for broadcast, and film production, and reality show production, and live sports, and the gamut of broadcast television. And what we really want out of 4K is to push what we do in standard definition and high definition out further so 4K just isn't about wild, clear pictures. It's going to be about increased color space and getting more of that moody color space back home. We actually can record more on the 16-bit cameras than film can. It's got an incredibly big and wide color palette. And why is that important? Well, if, if you want to maximize the capability of the, of the DCI projectors or go back and take a second bite of that digital negative later, so you would record 4K with that immense color space, go through um, what is called an academy color encoding process, um, you can get these wonderful colors that actually exceed the capability of almost anything you can display it on today. But that doesn't mean that downstream as we just went through that little box to the huge box and the bigger box to come, the color space is also widening as well. So as a, as a filmmaker and the preserver of images, you have this ability to get this absolutely incredible negative, put it in the vault and come back and revisit it later. So Grover Chris from, from Pictures was here earlier this week and they went back and rescanned the negative of Lawrence of Arabia. So this is a 50-year-old epic movie that would cost hundreds of millions of dollars to do today extras, locations, uh, the sets, everything's amazing about it. Because that was shot on film, they could go back and rescan that negative at 6K for a 4K release. So it brought back, it gave life to a movie that most of us have really forgotten about that was an absolute true epic. I can't forget about it because the building I work, work in is named after David Lee, who was the director of that movie, but it's, it's phenomenal to be able to do that. And that, that's what Chris was saying, is that that really drove him, his passion for lean yeah. drove him for that project. Well, it, you know, it's an absolutely, 
it's such an important film, and to have the ability to go back and rescan that negative for an enhanced Blu-ray disc uh, theatrical release again, and for people to actually see what was too easy because that was a 65 millimeter negative, one of the first, one of the first true epics. It's incredibly cool to go back and be able to rescan that and see it with today's display devices versus the the gate leave and, and what you had at the theater the day. So color space is a part of it. The resolution is part of it. It's also the dynamic range. So we, we have a generation of, of television shows that were shot in high definition, in high definition color space, which was absolutely wonderful for the beginning of high definition. But as we go further, you're locked into that color space and you're locked into that resolution. And yes, you can scale it, but it's not going to be the same type of experience as a camera native 4K experience would be. So. The idea, again, is as a preserver of images. How many people are filmmakers here? Just as an idea. Oh, you're all smarter than me. I, I'm a filmmaker. I'm just not a very good one. <laughs> I, I found that interesting when you were talking about earlier, the difference between HD yeah. and 4K. And I, it didn't really click until I was sitting watching your interview how, how different and how much more you get for the future. and. Just, just the, the how bigger the palette is. I mean, can you talk about that a little more? Well, the we make a camera that actually has an 8K by 2K imagery, so it allows you to go back and, and capture this huge, dense canvas. It's two gigabits per second of, of information that's compressed through one, so it's, it's data rate is, is absolutely huge. But it allows you to go into that image and if you want to crop and zoom and do all of the things that you filmmakers do with an image, it still allows you to have an absolutely pristine, from a resolution and noise and color standpoint, you've got as good of a negative as we can make today, which will translate downstream. And it's built for, you know, tape was wonderful because our, our responsibility ended at the end of the camera and the VTR, here's your tape, off you go to your, your post process. You know, today we've got it's all computer based. It's, it's all computer grading, computer editing, and um, we make the files that are in containers for the the future and have the bandwidth to handle future requirements. For if that makes sense. So again, 50 years from now, you could go back to this 8K by 2K negative and do a restoration with whatever tools they have then, and and still have a, an extremely competitive image. Where with HD, it's kind of like watching SD, you know, it's, it's the same the same factor, if you know what I mean. Right. It's not going to be as competitive. Yeah, appreciate that. So, okay. so just, just to figure out, it's, this isn't just about resolution. It really is about pushing the boundaries of, of all facets of that negative from dynamic range to increasing the frame rates from 24 to 48 up to 240, doing slow, doing things that were very, very difficult in film and possible in HD become very possible with today's new tools. And from a company, we have all of these different um, wants and needs for, we have a cinema agenda, we have a TV agenda, uh, other screen devices, you know, the, the tablets and the mobile devices and, and home theater and things like that. So we've got a vested interest in pushing the outlook for all of this. And then we need to make a palette of gear that is for the production, presentation, and distribution of these signals. So we've got invested in all parts of the workflow, and this kind of illustrates it that we're part of the acquisition process, we're part of the post process. We're going to talk about this digital motion picture center that we have in Culver, where we have 17 different partners, these computer companies, in essence, are software companies that are going to take our signal and grade them and, and transform them and, and color them, and we have to work in lockstep with them. If, uh, if we don't, uh, the image will suffer and, and the experience will suffer. So we've got uh, maybe a little bit of shameless marketing here, but we're at all parts of the ecosystem in 4K. So a lot of people think 4K is just the new 3D, and it really couldn't be farther from the truth. The difficulty with 3D is 3D is its own experience, and those holy crap moments in 3D don't necessarily translate that well to 2D. And it's a different style, it's a different space, it's a different canvas than 2D. And the best 3D ignores the 2D canvas and goes and becomes like pie and does itself a thing. You can have an incremental start with 4K. You can start with the camera, and the camera is going to offer you just not more resolutions, all the things that we talked about. 
the increased color depth, the increased latitude, all of the things that as a filmmaker you would like to be able to capture light differently, like the light, light the way that you're used to with film, with your best instrument, with your eye, and not spend time on the limitations of the camera. That's what the 4K camera will bring with you. The rest of the process can be done with HD if you go and do this, you know, doing an HD show, knowing that you've got this wonderful negative for the second bite of the apple downstream. So it's not like 3D. You don't have to take your entire post-production workflow and make that 4K from the word go. And uh, we can do that at a, large, a lot of different budget levels. But it's nice to know you can come back and get this naked letter. But the filmmaking benefits up front truly are, are worth the test that I would encourage you to do. Um, we're a, a content company. You know, Sony Pictures is in the film restoration business. We talked about once at Arabia and then Grover. They've got a mandate to do a lot more films. There's also a process that will make HD experience better with Blu-ray by going to the downers and 4K masters to Blu-ray. And we're hoping that the Blu-ray Association can come together and come up with a 4K standard so you've got a nice package media at home. But you know, we are in the content creation business and the infrastructure for 4K, of course, is already available for theaters. We've, we've done around 13,000 of these projectors and we're not the only manufacturer in 4K. So if you want to see the films, that infrastructure is done. There's another whole tenant to, to 4K, which is absolutely really, really cool, and it's more television-oriented. So again, this idea of incrementally adding 4K to your storytelling experience, we've been working with Fox on using a 4K camera as a, a super zoom. So that little box I showed you, again, 720p, which is the sports production format, is one-ninth of the resolution of this 4K camera. Actually, it's one-eighteenth of this camera. But 4K itself is nine times the resolution of 720p. So if I can shoot at 720p, I've got nine virtual quadrants, or I can fly a virtual camera within that 4K canvas and pull on a 720p image. That's beautiful. And not only can I do that, I can bump this image up to what would be 32 times electronic zoom of the 720p. So did anybody here watch the Daytona 500? <coughs> you had a great experience. So did you remember this shot? <laughs> you alone apparently had this wonderful experience, but there was a, a shot where there was a piece of debris on the track, and they zoomed in on that one piece of debris and pulled back just as the camera, that just as the car hit that piece of debris, and you had that beautiful shot. So that, that is a 4K camera at work to be able to do that. How many cameras did you guys have uh, unfortunately, it wasn't ours, but it was a 4K camera. <laughs> Small caveat, but we worked with Fox on football, but um, on that show, they wanted a 240 frame rate camera, which uh, our, our dear friends over at 4A make. And uh, that resolution is a new change in storytelling that if I could start on the wide shot, come in and get those fine details, I can, I can really, I can change the way I, I storytell live or, or off replay. And this is this is the coolest application. And if you if you come to NEB, please come by and see it. So, uh, with the the wonderful gift of, of electronics, we can take two 4K canvases and stitch them together and create an 8K by 2K canvas, if you will. So you think, well, yeah, nice. So from that, I can create a 720p or a 1080 camera and fly that camera with within the boundaries of that 2K by 4K. The cool thing about this is I'm recording the entire plane surface on, on one device. And if I want to go back and do that storytelling where I zoom in on that little bit and pull back to reveal the story, I've got it again. So Canadian, you heard me say about, about the process and things like that. Um, um, hockey, the fight never happens in the middle of the camera action. They always have to go back and then zoom in and get the focus. And you know, and, and that's why we watch hockey up there. Right? It's, it's, uh, it's for that, but that always happens behind the play. With with this, you've recorded the entire playing service, so you always have whatever happened available to you on replay, and then this capability to zoom into that by a factor of 32x, again, it's a really, really cool storytelling thing. So we can use it in the high definition broadcast. And it completely translates to the filmmakers. I mean, they can right. go in and get punch in and get the high quality, you know, close-ups that they may have thought they didn't have. You know, the, the 8K out of the F65, uh, you know, for motion stabilization and whatever things that you need to do, 
convert that image, blow it up a little bit. It's, it's phenomenal. And uh, we have a, a torture test film called El Dorado that Curtis Clark gave us a shot for us. And there's a lot of the zooms within that are just digital zooms, and you never know. The wonderful thing about digital zooms, you get a lot, you can rehearse that over and over and over and over again until you commit it to it. You can only really do it. You know, once you, you cut tape, then you're done. So. So this canvas also could be used for a, a 4K broadcast for replay. Um, for Vegas sports book, they're always looking for something cool. So again, this great big canvas where you can watch the whole game as if you were a spectator. She's queuing me that we, we got to get to the oh Q&A quickly. Boy, it goes, but time flies when you're having fun. Anyway, so I'll, I'll, work, I'll work through this. The, the real neat thing about sports is there's um, one of the biggest, the biggest, um, investments in sports is um, player motion tracking. So because you've got two fixed cameras and you know all of the geometry on the field, you can go back and replay and say, this guy was in coordinate X, Y, and started drawing all of your player tracking and, and motion tracking and figure out the acceleration of the ball and who's coming and who's hit who and um, it's all this analysis that can be done. But because these cameras are fixed, the geometry is really, really easy and then again, we can take from that player tracking information and have a second screen experience with it. So it seems, you know, there's there's bigger plans than, than just the resolution. CES this year we announced uh, a two-home VOD service based on 4K. So those who invest in the televisions and the, and the home server can start getting content that is Sony Pictures or indie films or, or other things delivered directly to your home and, and forget appointment-based television. Just some of the content, uh, After Earth is coming out in the end of May, shot on the F-65. You know, uh, the, the difficult thing about the motion picture business is all of these shows, nobody's shooting a wedding with a 4K camera yet, you know. So our practice run was in the jungle in Puerto Rico in 95 degree humidity with a, a minor star and his son on a minor budget movie, which uh, I encourage you to see. It's absolutely a wonderful experience. We've got two releases in April, so we had tent pole pictures. And here's an example, too, where Oblivion was shot 4K because the DP loves the camera, loves the roll off, loves what he can do with it, and how he likes the camera. But the movie's too big. And that decision is made financially because of special effects and server time and data storage and archiving. But you can always go back to that negative later and, and do a 4K version. Um, Evil Dead is a, is a more modest budget film that they wanted. A look. This will be 4K from stem to stern. Overall, um, we work daily with ColorWorks. These guys are, are, are my savior. They're some of the smartest color people I know. It is a Sony DI house. Uh, absolutely wonderful group of, of technologists that we work with to uh, figure stuff out in 4K. And they've been doing 4K for a long time, and, and they're absolutely wonderful of it. They just started to get to the same price point in television. They started a completely separate operation from cinema. That's just going to concentrate on, on 4K post for television shows. So we're trying to do that at a budget. And this is just a couple of, of shows that they're working on now. And again, um, both of these are being finished in 1925-1080, but the DPs love the conditioning of the camera and the roll on. And they get a second line of the apple if, if we go into syndication with it. Really, really briefly on our digital motion picture center. So there's, um, this is a, we're really good at cameras. Really, really good at cameras. We're, we're not so great on developing our own tools for DI and grading and timing and everything else. So we rely on Resolve and Simulate and, and Blackmagic and Avid and Adobe and everybody associated with it. So we needed to have a place where we could bring all of these tools into one spot and, and work with third-party companies to figure out what works, what doesn't work, what can we change, what does a filmmaker need, how do we make this easier, what's impossible, what's possible, what's bugging you. So every Thursday we have a, a course that is free on 4K production, you'll get to touch, feel, create, screen, edit 4K um, <coughs> in one course in one day. And now that we have the F55 that uh, is a little bit more of an attainable camera, um, uh, the little lower rental cost to be used for a lot more TV it gives you an opportunity to uh, to go in and, and touch field C and, and figure out. And, and any works. filmmaker could yeah. technically email you and go onto the lot in Culver City and Absolutely. start playing with if, it. If you go to um, uh, www.sony backslash professional 35 millimeter, you'll have 
this story and other stories, but just just search DMPC on, on Google and uh, you can see what we're about and you can make a, make a reservation. It's, it's a wonderful thing because you and 15 other filmmakers will be there that day to you know, you get their, you get other people's um, inquiries and, and feedback and it's good. And again, this idea that we need to work with all of these other companies to make to make your pictures what they can be, uh, that, that's what it's for. And all of these companies actually donated all of the gear to be able to do this and, and support us, which was really, really, really appreciated. So, um, so I have time for a wrap up, dear? Excellent. Oh, so I actually, I made it, so. The enabling technology, um, anybody here shoot with an F-35, SOW 9000? So the most expensive component in those cameras was actually the CCD block, the, the wafer that was at 35 millimeter. CCD and uh, by itself, a 35 millimeter CCD was, was sixty thousand dollars as a component, and our yield on that technology was less than one percent of the chips we made we could actually use. The rest of them, we had to check out. There was either residual point noise or excessive background noise or something that we found objectionable, and we didn't have the processing in the camera to, to do all of the fancy digital noise reductions and things like that. They weren't pure enough, so we chucked them away. So uh, an F35, the predecessor to the 65, with the tape deck that went with it and, and all of the all of the accessories surrounding it was a $300,000 package. So it became very <coughs> rare, fine air, and it was a, a rental product. Um, and huge cap costs, and everybody knew that things were moving very, very quickly to, to other types of, of devices. So uh, God love the rental companies for their investment. ZMOS has fundamentally changed cameras forever. So from from your iPod camera through to 4K cameras, CMOS has a, is a tunable instrument that's repairable, um, inexpensive to make. Our yield is really good, so that three hundred thousand dollar camera package has become eighty five and, and now fifty, and is a, a better rental cost. But that is that is really done it, and we've moved from tape, which you know I, I love tape, and there's there's a comfort in tape. You know that you can watch the tape. You know that people with the right BTR can see your tape. Files, man, are there. It's still um, somewhat early days, and we've all had a file experience, right? Um, but memory has has dropped dramatically. You know, I, I was laughing that uh, we used to sell a. A system called Edit Master and hard drives were a thousand dollars per gig at that time. And I've got a four gig memory, a four gig memory card flash. I bought Divi for ten bucks. So a, a terabyte hard drive is, is fifty bucks. You know what I mean? Uh, that has changed, and because the cameras are really laying things <coughs> off the memory, the the whole structure has changed dramatically. So we have a. I think we have almost ten minutes. Five ten minutes to throw it up to the to the audience. Okay. Do you want to field some filmmaker questions? Sure. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, I have uh, two projects we put together right now. The storyline specifically, emotionally, and plot-wise deal with outside night shots. Okay. So I agree, I'm going to talk about characters in an alleyway under one street like this. Okay. So I really need to find a way without spending 50, 60, 80 grand on a huge camera set you can go with this. Now, I've got a DP who's really good on the red, and I can go in that direction with some stuff. But for some of this indie gorilla stuff, yeah. I really want to bring a Cassavetes approach to it with this new stuff. So, you guys just came out with this camera, the BG900. Yes. It's got a full frame 35 millimeter sensor. Yes. And the body is like, I think, three grand or something like that. Yes. But then I see this Chinese company that's just come out with a 4K digital camera called Cine Raw. And I think it's going to be a third the price of the red. Now, I know this Chinese company may not, the quality may not be there, mm -hmm. but I keep asking myself, when Black Magic comes out with a 2.5K camera for around 200 bucks, why aren't, when's that one company going to, I'm hoping, it's, I'm praying it's going to be you guys. Because I like, I love what you do, Lawrence and Ray. I mean, I'm just a big, big film thing for me. Is that really? So I'm just wondering why I can't see this, this knowledge is there for all these companies have access to. Why aren't these things being more combined for a price that really can help somebody like me until I get to the next step mm -hmm. where I have the success in that? When I'm starting off, my budget may be 10 or 12 grand. I just don't 
happening. So how how to make the, uh, someone who's shooting a film for under twenty five thousand yeah, dollars? Especially if I got specific yeah. night shots or color so, shots, where yeah. I don't want to have a big crew out there with all these yeah. lights flashing. So the two part question: one of them is is basically the same, and can I shoot effectively in the yes. dark without penalty of noise and yes. all of those things that you don't want in your image? And then the second part is is on on cost of the lights. Yeah. So the and you show the VG900, which is a, a consumer. So the consumer yeah. consumer cameras benefit from economies of scale with the compression schemes that they use. So that uses a, that uses a consumer AVC codec for high definition. So it's a full frame 35, but it goes down to uh, uh, an AVC based, very difficult to work with in a workflow um, type of compression signal. The lens that it comes with is is okay, but it might not be fast enough. So the the difference in, in the pro gear and uh, either uh, a seven hundred or an F five or F three, if you wanted to rent it for the duration of your project, might be interesting because it's the same full sensor. The the base ASA of the F five is is two thousand, mm -hmm. so you could run that pretty hard before. It's starting to fall apart, and it's got a recording mode of, of XABC or RAW. So, I, and the whole thing is is, is test because all of these cameras are, are a little bit a little bit different. Time for I hate to say it, it's just one more right here. Um, for anyone, kind of feedback on the for anyone who can't afford cameras, I mean, the way like some of the try and requirements and materials are like small ships or things like that, like will be the most common way to. I, I've never heard this issue. Before. Filmmakers trying to get money to do a film. That's so I mean, not, well, it's not get <laughs> money, not get money. It's just like the equipment. No, no, no. I, 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 I hear it. I, I, I totally get it. Um, we work with an awful lot of rental partners that have like Panavision that have student programs and indie programs, and they're really your best bet. We're a, a quite a big dysfunctional company, and we can't. We can lend you a camera, but we don't manufacture the lenses or the sticks or so it's difficult for us to package properly and you may want to use uh, you know for costing reasons a keeper recorder or, or something else so um, but that said we do work with different foundations and, and we give a lot of cameras to schools every year uh, but I, I would encourage you to reach out to Panavision because they do have an emerging filmmakers program and uh, get really good at Kickstarter <laughs> <laughs> which we had a, uh, a whole forum on that a uh, couple couple of days ago. I'd like to all right, so we're going to move on to the screening of, of our film. Anything else I need to know, Danielle, before we start? No? Well, I'd like to thank Rob, Rob Oslaz, and really appreciate it. Enjoy spending the time with you. Yeah, why don't you, you want to introduce the film for us? So as, as uh, the, the kickoff for the, the F-65 was in the jungles of Costa Rica and, and, and parts unknown, the, the first time that we used an F-55, we went to Sri Lanka. And there's a Sony Depot right there, and uh, lots of skilled uh, skilled people in, in RAW available immediately. And uh, so this is the first time that the the crew, the the crew, the assistants uh, had ever actually.